Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the LSE for this online event on making use of moral and social capital, faith communities and climate finance. This event is co-hosted by the LSE Faith Center and the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment. My name is Robert Faulkner. I'm the research director at the Grantham Research Institute and I'll be hosting this event. The idea for this panel emerged from the LSE Faith Center's extracurricular student program, Faith and Climate Action, which is open to all LSE students to apply for regardless of faith or belief. For more information, please go to the programs page of the LSE Faith Center website. I'm very pleased to be here to welcome three esteemed speakers to the LSE today. Professor Nick Robbins, Loretta Minghella, and Dr. Mohamed Kressin. I will introduce each before their opening statements. Let me just say a few words about the format for this webinar. Our speakers will offer some initial opening reflections on the topic of conversation today. After that, we then move into a panel discussion chaired by myself, and then I'll introduce questions from the audience and ask the panel to respond to those. In case you would like to tweet about this event, for all Twitter users, please note the hashtag today is LSE, hashtag LSE Faith and Climate. I should also mention this event is going to be recorded and should we work out all the technical requirements for this, we will be making it available as a podcast. As usual, therefore, there will be a chance for you in the audience to join in today and put questions to our panel. To submit your questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Questions will then be submitted to myself as the chair, and I will try and put as many of your questions to the panelists. Please let us know your name and affiliation. And we are particularly keen to hear from our students, alumni, and incoming students, so let us know who you are. All right. That much by way of introduction, I'd now like to introduce the first part of the event where our three speakers make opening statements of around 10 minutes or so. And I'm delighted to first hand over to Professor Nick Robbins, our first speaker. Nick Robbins is Professor in Practice for Sustainable Finance here at the Grantham Research Institute at the LSE. From 2014 to 2018, Nick was coordinator of UNEP's inquiry into a sustainable financial system. And before that, he was head of the Climate Change Center of Excellence at HSBC from 2007 to 2014. Nick will now be kicking off this event by reflecting on the future of sustainable finance. Nick, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Robert. And thanks very much for inviting me to, to speak. I'm just gonna share my, share my screen. Right, is that, is that okay, Robert? Is that um, the reading okay? Very good. So um, thanks very much. The next 10 minutes or so, I've got this sort of daunting prospect of trying to uh, provide a sort of framework for our discussions. I mean, to declare an interest, I'm a person of faith myself from the uh, Christian tradition. Um, so uh, that's from where I'm, where I'm coming, but obviously it's a delight to really talk with, with many others uh, of you in the audience and obviously uh, with Mohammed and, and Loretta uh, as well. So, Without my further uh, ado, so what is the agenda for climate finance that we face uh, today? And I'd like to pick out sort of four areas uh, for us before we get on to the, the faith dimension, perhaps. So the first is clearly we have a, a major task of reallocating capital for a net zero economy. Much is going on there. Clearly, we are investors, banks, public finance are reallocating to green assets, bonds and equities and so on. Huge upsurge in shareholder engagement, um, major announcements on that. Uh, investors, financial institutions also divesting, uh, particularly from high carbon assets, fossil fuels, and also using their voice in policy advocacy to shape uh, the rules of the game, which will um, make sure that capital is aligned with the net zero goal. So uh, that's the one uh, task. Second, clearly, is we have already climate shocks underway. These will intensify, so we need to uh, build resilience. For finance, 
Clearly, this leads uh, a much better understanding of climate risk, clearly the physical risks, uh, but also transition risks, understanding of potential stranded assets that are going to take place. And also, I think uh, an area where we need to put a lot more focus is thinking about the investments that are needed uh, to build that adaptation, particularly uh, in vulnerable parts uh, of the world. So that's number two. Number three is action on climate change involves a, a strong social dimension and involves a, a question of, of, of justice. In the work I've been doing, I've been looking at the, the just transition and the role of banks, investors there, particularly to ensure that workers' rights are, are protected and, and, and the interests of communities as well. But also clearly within the Paris Agreement is a very powerful uh, commitment to ensuring an increase in financial flows to the global south as a, as a key element of, of the financial financial uh, debate. And then finally is as part of this we're not just thinking about particular institutions or particular assets but actually building a sustainable financial system which has these characteristics is aligned to net zero is resilient does express uh, questions of, of climate justice but also has some other elements that, that is transparent clearly we need better disclosure through frameworks such as the task force of climate related disclosures institutions need to be accountable uh, it, financial institutions also need to be responsive particularly maybe to uh, the needs of households to SMEs in developing countries and also to to be rooted to be uh, focused on place-based needs so that i would suggest is a sort of framework to to, to start on and now i'd like to just turn to the, the dimension of, of of faith so why are faith communities particularly relevant and, and so so critical one of course is faith communities are very very large and very significant uh, so first in terms of institutional investment estimates suggest about 10 percent of financial investments are invested directly by faith-based uh, institutions so a large proportion uh, and beyond that uh, people of faith uh, form the the vast majority of global populations um, around uh, 80 percent according to some estimates so a large a very significant area the second is that faith communities can be pioneers in terms of climate finance. Not always, but I think there's a really interesting track record, which I think I'm sure we'll see uh, presented uh, today. So, so clearly in terms of ethical investments, um, uh, going back to the 1940s, in some cases really picking up in the 1970s, also in terms of innovative instruments, and, and I'd like to point to green sukuks in the uh, Islamic tradition, and then also uh, collect uh, initiatives. One uh, I'd like to cite is the Transition Pathway Initiative, uh, very much uh, an initiative uh, jointly by the national investment bo bodies of the Church of England with the Environment Agency uh, and uh, Simon Dietz uh, at the Grantham Research Institute here at the LSE uh, is the, is, leads the academic uh, and research foundations uh, for that. So I think, that, uh, I think um, faith-based organizations can actually be a sort of pioneers in terms of collecting issues. I've seen also in terms of the work I've been doing on just transition, again, the faith-based organizations have really been at the, 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 the vanguard of that. Of the 150 investors who've signed up to that, about 20% are, are faith-based from a number of different, uh, different, different faiths. And then faith-based communities can actually bring something really distinctive to the finance debate. Um, and I'd just like to touch on um, some of those aspects um, in my next uh, in my next slide. So here I'm going to I'm going to venture into sort of perhaps dangerous ground, um, sort of trying to pull out some some themes looking across faiths. As I said, I come from the, the Christian tradition. There are investments uh, now investment uh, approaches to to climate from a number of faiths, from, from the Buddhist tradition, from Christians, from Taoists, from Hindus, from the Jewish tradition, from the Islamic tradition as we'll hear, from Sikhs and also from Shinto. So they're broad range. But I'd like to sort of touch upon maybe five dimensions that I think where a particular distinctness is brought uh, by faith and I'd like to thank uh, Ian Christie for his contributions developing this list. So number one is the planet, uh, the, is, is the planetary dimension key to climate change and, and the recognition that the earth is, is, is not ours, that is actually created um, for uh, the human uh, population, for humans to, to flourish and this is a particular emphasis I think on this notion of, of, of stewardship uh, by financial institutions, by investors of of, uh, of, of, the, of the planet, but I think also a focus on the need to protect the commons, uh, particularly the climate, but also uh, biodiversity. Uh, 
The second area I would suggest is, is that in terms of how we, we think about people in the uh, climate change agenda and how we think about people as financial institutions, there is a, a preference uh, for the poorest. Pope Francis uh, has highlighted in one of his speeches about climate change being a brutal act of injustice to the world's poor and future generations. So I think that that is another distinctive uh, element. The third is around time horizons. We know that uh, one of the, the, pro the problems or the, the flaws in current approaches to finance is a, often a short-term horizon. We have a tragedy of horizon with climate change, according to Mark Carney. And I think um, faith-based uh, communities can really bring a, a long-term focus to the, the challenge of tackling climate change over, over decades uh, and beyond. And that's really uh, important. The fourth is about the question of, of, of impact. And I think one thing that is common to, to most uh, faith-based organizations is obviously a, a focus on changing uh, behavior and a focus also on, on working with others to have broader spillover effects uh, in the marketplace. And the final one is, is one of, of accountability. It's clearly not just a question of, of, of the reporting and TCFD, but a very sense of, of personal accountability uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, the, to the creator and to, to uh, how you will account for that to, to, your, to your maker. So those are some of the, five, the areas. I'd like to really just tie, sort of building on those, uh, think ahead and think about what does this mean for, for where we are now in the, in the COVID crisis, but particularly thinking through uh, to COP26 uh, in November of 2021, and some of those are real priorities that we might want to think about um, discussing. So the first of these, the, the net zero uh, dimension, really making this at the heart of the COVID uh, recovery. We have uh, an increasing agreement uh, around the need to uh, build back better. Um, and, and I think certainly um, asset owners, uh, not least the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, has made a very important contributions on how we can do this. This, I think we have the opportunity for accelerating fossil fuel restructuring. I think we're seeing the bringing forward, for example, of peak oil almost by, by, by a decade. And also we have the opportunity to highlight uh, green uh, priorities within uh, recovering and uh, stimulus uh, programs. So that would be a first uh, priority. Then on this theme of, of resilience, uh, clearly uh, we've seen through COVID as a zoonotic disease, our, our reliance on stable uh, natural foundations for our prosperity and well-being. Uh, and I think this could be a second focus for us. So I think obviously this is a discussion we're having around climate, but I think uh, recent uh, experiences have really highlighted the need to think about that in the broader context of uh, biodiversity and, and protecting nature to really make ourselves resilient both to pandemics and also extreme events. So that would be a, a second. In the theme of, of, of climate justice for financial institutions, uh, this, this theme of the just transition, I think, is, 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 is prompting people to think about connecting the, the E and the S of ESG, the environmental and, and the social. And I would see huge opportunity, particularly in the next year, to really think about how we can scale up uh, global impact investing as a tool for, for the just transition. And then a the final theme, the theme of, of system change and building a financial system. One theme I'd really like to, to maybe hear uh, thoughts on from uh, the other panelists and from you on, on, who are participating is how do we connect these really interesting activities that have been done by faith-based institutions with action by uh, people of faith, both in terms of their own uh, portfolios, their own financial behavior, and also in terms of how they can conduct assertive policy advocacy. We're seeing really interesting examples um, here in the UK, uh, the Make My Money Matter uh, initiative, really trying to connect uh, people with their, their pensions in particular, but also other savings. And again, I think that the, uh, the communities of faith can really add to that, that question of, of system uh, change. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, finish there, uh, Robert, and uh, I think we can stop sharing the, the slides at this point. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Nick. Thank you so much for this introductory statement. And, and you've uh, very nicely laid out the, the whole horizon of action that we're looking at here in this context and then what religious communities can contribute to that. I'm now delighted to hand over to our second speaker, Loretta Minghella. Loretta took up the role of First Church Estates Commissioner in November 2017. Her main duty is serving as the chair of the Assets Committee of the Church Commissioners which is responsible for an investment portfolio of around 8 billion pounds, I'm told. 
Formerly, she was chief executive of Christian Aid between 2010 and 2017. She's a lawyer by training with a career in financial regulation. Uh, she was, for example, previously the head of enforcement law policy and international cooperation for the Financial Services Authority and the former CEO of Financial Services Compensation Scheme. Now, Loretta will be speaking to us about the Transition Pathway Initiative, which is an initiative associated with the Grantham Research Institute and the role of the Church of England uh, more broadly in climate finance. Loretta, welcome. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much indeed and good afternoon, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to be part of this afternoon's panel. And I want to start by congratulating the LSE for bringing together this multidisciplinary event. I think recent uh, the events of recent months have shown how important it is that we, we convene across disciplines and I hope that we'll see much more of this kind of conversation. Um, I, I will focus in a little while on, on uh, the perspective I have as First Commissioner, but I really want to start by picking up from my experience at Christian Aid because as we look ahead and see how far um, along the journey we still have to go, I think it's easy to forget just how far we've already come and how big a role faith communities have already played in, in the battle to make sure that climate finance goes in the right direction. Because climate change is the most pressing and most complex social, economic, political, environmental issue of our time. But it also has a very human, a very human face. And I saw that very close up when I was the chief executive of Christian Aid. My most searing memory is from visiting communities affected by Typhoon Haiyan in uh, December 2013. I visited a year on to see the brilliant work that Christian Aid and Christian Aid partners have done to help communities get back on their feet. But when I spoke to communities affected, they wanted me to know the devastation that they had experienced on, on the day the typhoon struck. And one woman spoke to me about how she'd found herself caught up in a body of water, six meters high, with her four children swimming beside her for hours, and them calling out to her mum, how long do we have to keep on swimming? How long? How? And she, instead of being like so many other people there were, wanting to say how grateful they were for the support, left me with this one question, what are you doing about climate change? It is my most searing memory of that trip because people in poverty don't want us to turn up expecting them to be grateful. They want us to address the underlying issues which make them vulnerable. And that highlighted for me how much climate change is a justice issue, uh, as Nick was saying. When I arrived at Christian Aid in 2010, people were really devastated at the time by the failure of the Copenhagen summit. They were really, really down in the mouth. Everyone had pulled out the stops for a great deal to be struck and it wasn't struck. But that's when I saw the power of faith because people were driven by more than just a political agenda for the time being. They were driven by an underlying conviction that justice required really radical action. And it was that theological perspective we had at Christian Aid, that climate change was an issue of justice, that there was an issue here of structural sin or original sin, if you like, in terms of the fundamental relationship between humankind and God's uh, creation of the earth. That theological conviction drove us on and we used it to keep focused on the path to Paris. It was then five years ahead of us but we knew we had to fight for a really radical agreement that would cut emissions, a really radical agreement that would commit to changing the way the economy worked, uh, that would provide enough support for investment in green energy and protect the interests of the world's poorest people. And we knew that we had to do that in partnership and it's our theological conviction at Christian Aid that you had to work in partnership to get anywhere. Uh, one of the key partnerships domestically was the Climate Coalition. And that, one of the big players in that, apart from Christian Aid, was Cathod, the Roman Catholic uh, equivalent of Christian Aid. And together we promoted a really positive understanding 
of how the world could be better if we loved one another a bit more dearly. And we got people who weren't really politically very uh, sort of motivated to recognise that everything they loved was jeopardised by climate change and that that was something, a concern that they could legitimately and confidently express to politicians. And I remember very clearly going to Downing Street in February 2015 to see David Cameron, uh, along with the chief execs of a few other uh, environmental and development agencies. And he was presented with a little green heart, a badge crocheted by a schoolgirl who was a cathode supporter. Uh, it was part of the Show the Love campaign. And we were there to ask him to sign the climate pledge. Uh, and I got the job of putting the ask to him. I think I got that job because he was always very influenced by the Whitney Christian Aid Group, who would turn up at, um, at his surgery and ask to be seen. He could see that they were motivated and organized. And he, on more than one occasion with me, uh, referred to his conversations with them. And as a result of putting pressure on him that day, the Conservatives signed a cross-party pledge, pledging to work with the leaders of the Lib Dems and the Labour Party to fight for a great outcome from Paris and also to commit to the UK's phasing out its dependency on coal. And so that was a really uh, important step forward, I think, in, in the fight for the right outcome in Paris. Um, but I learned a little bit more about how politicians were influenced by faith communities at a dinner shortly thereafter. Um, I won't name the people there because it was a private dinner, but I'll put it this way, very senior clergy, very senior politicians. And we were being pressed. We were all um, Anglicans around the table, the people of faith. We were being pressed to try and make sure that the Vatican would say something very, very persuasive ahead of Paris. And we tried to explain that we were doing everything we could, but our right to command any particular message from the Vatican was rather limited. Uh, but we were obviously in conversation with colleagues of other faiths and we, would, um, we were confident that something would be forthcoming. Well, it was in May, if you remember, that, uh, 2015, that Laudato Si, the papal encyclical was published. And if you were looking for a strong call from the Vatican, there it was, the strongest possible call for a global and unified coalition of people of faith to stand up for the world's poorest people and for God's creation. And we built on that work. We worked with the ACT Alliance network of over 100 Christian development agencies that we were part of. And we worked with representatives of other faiths and Bishop Nick Holton, the Bishop of Salisbury, and also the lead in the House of Lords for the Church of England on issues of the environment, presented to Francois Hollande uh, in the week of the climate ne negotiations in Paris, a petition of 1.8 million signatures of people of faith calling for the strongest possible agreement. And Christina Figueres, who was then leading for the Convention on Climate Change, cried because she knew, she cried, she was so moved. She knew that there was a real possibility when people like this spoke from, their, from the, um, the, the driver of their faith, from all over the world, from all different faiths, she knew that that had the potential to drive a political breakthrough. And I preached on the Sunday in Salisbury Cathedral with Bishop Nick at present, and together we celebrated the news that was coming out from Paris that we had the agreement that we hoped for. But the agreement could only ever be the start. It was what made all the work we've been doing since on climate finance really possible. Uh, but it was the social and moral capital that was invested ahead of Paris that really put us on the right footing. Now, the Church of England had been gearing up for an agreement of this kind, and General Synod had been putting pressure on the national investing bodies to do more about the exposure in the portfolios to fossil fuel companies. And I was a member of the Ethical Investment Advisory Group to the Church of England at the time. Uh, earlier in the year, we published advice rooted in theology around actually care for creation and the stewardship which Christians need to show for God's creation. And we advised the national investing bodies that it was time 
to divest from the um, most uh, egregious emitters and that it was time to do more to engage with companies who are emitting the most uh, fossil fuels. Uh, I, I ended up taking over as first commissioner, moving from Christian Aid in 2017. By then, the most straightforward work had been done. Uh, the church had divested from companies with more, of 10, more than 10% of their income from, from coal and tar sands. And the engagement work really was well underway and bearing fruit. And this is where I want to talk about the Transition Pathway Initiative, because although placards with climate justice now written on them and signatures on petitions had got us to the agreement, to get that translated into corporate change required something more. And I want to pay tribute to the Grantham Institute of the London School of Economics for the pivotal role it has played in helping the church to move forward. The Transition Pathway Initiative takes companies and looks at them through two lenses. One that says, what is management doing? How is management organized to understand uh, the journey it needs to make uh, to align itself with the Paris Agreement? And is it uh, transparent about that? And how is it organized? And the other lens is to say, okay, well, it might be doing what looks like the right thing from a management point of view, but what in effect is happening in terms of its carbon performance? And the brilliant thing about the TPI is that it is a very transparent tool. So uh, the research is done by the Grantham Institute. It has that intellectual rigor. It is open data. Everyone can see exactly the methodology and exactly the results. And we and other investors use it to engage with the companies that we've invested in to say, look, this is what we're seeing. This is good enough, this is not good enough. We need you to do this more, that more, if you want to us to stay invested in you. Because the political and moral and social capital of our members of the Church of England has not stopped with the Paris Agreement being struck, we are still held to account by our General Synod. And uh, a year or so into my time, General Synod asked us to consider divesting more or less uh, straight away, why were we still invested in these companies that haven't made enough progress since 2015? And after a dialogue, an open dialogue in General Synod, we agreed some tough deadlines uh, to apply the tool to our uh, corporate investments. And what we've said to Synod is we will start to divest in 2020, so here we are, we will start to divest from those companies which um, on our assessment informed by the Transition Pathway Initiative are not doing enough and will not get there uh, to align themselves uh, with the Paris Agreement. And we will complete our engagement and firmly divest by 2022 from all companies by then not showing themselves able and willing to align. So we have, uh, with the accountability that we have to our wider membership, um, a, quite a, a discipline ahead of us in terms of engagement and divestment. But it's not all about engagement and divestment, it's also about getting our own house in order. We've committed to having a portfolio that's net zero by 2050. The church has committed to net zero by 2030 for its operations. So all over the country, individual churches and dioceses are looking at how they can cut their emissions in their day-to-day -day operations and we are we will hold ourselves accountable to one another for our work in that respect. And of course, we're also investing, not just divesting. So we're investing in forestry, which helps with our carbon capture. We are investing in solar, we're investing in wind. We're always on the lookout for how we can meet our financial responsibilities and our environmental commitments at the same time. Um, I'll stop there because I could go on much too long. And I see uh, uh, Robert looking a little bit nervous. Um, but say this, that it is a work in progress, that I believe the moral uh, capital has already achieved a great deal, um, but God's justice requires that we don't stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Loretta. And I, I wish I didn't need to uh, <laughs> bring your opening remark to a conclusion. I, I, I wanted to hear more, but we'll come back in the uh, Q&A session to some of the points you've raised there. Um, I will now hand over to our third speaker, Dr. Mohamed Krasim, 
Mohammed is a development economist with a good 20 years experience of working with Islamic development and financial institutions on strategies for sustainable development and social impact. He's formerly worked for the Chamber of Commerce and the Center for Enterprise in the UK. Uh, he was an assistant CEO of Muslim Aid and he's now heading Islamic Relief's Global Islamic Microfinance Unit. Mohammed will be reflecting on how Islamic theology intersects with sustainable stewardship and highlight some of the practical examples of Islamic finance that are at work in this area. Mohammed, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Robert. Um, very kind introduction there by you. And also uh, thanks to the LSE Faith Center and the Grantham Center for giving me the ominous task to talk uh, and discuss the role of Islam in uh, the topic of climate finance. Um, I shall share my screen um, and uh, hopefully you can follow um, some of the kind of roller coaster ride that I'm um, having to uh, unfortunately expose you to, um, only to give you a, a quick sort of run through um, where we're at at the moment. We're not quite finished yet with the presentation. Here we are. Okay, so um, in my opening remarks, I just want to first of all start with a little bit of an intellectual health warning because the Muslim word Islam is a very complex entity. Um, I will also talk a little bit about how, um, what kind of religious, moral, social, and financial um, capitals uh, we have and how we have deployed these for change, and then also uh, briefly introduce some of the um, financial instruments that are used in Islamic finance, particularly green sukuks, in terms of climate finance. Right, first of all, as I said, a, a quick run through um, the Muslim world, which is a really complex uh, story, it has very many complex relationships. Um, well, first of all, um, Currently, we have about you know, a, a nearly a quarter of the world's population being of the Islamic faith. Um, and it's a growing number, according to the, the Pew uh, study recently. Um, it's also a very diverse uh, global faith community, um, ethnic diverse, linguistically diverse, socially, culturally diverse, really ranging from um, West Africa all the way to China. Um, and you can see uh, the map um, on the slide that just shows the kind of percentage in, in, in these countries in terms of the Muslim population. Um, we have sort of a, a global um, uh, transnational uh, body, the uh, Organization of Islamic Countries, which currently has 57 member countries, 53 of them are Muslim majority countries. And uh, all of you are probably also broadly familiar with the kind of broad theological kind of divide between Shia and Sunni Muslims. Um, but there also are significant um, theological and jurisprudential differences within those broad uh, schools of thought. Um, there's also no agreed upon religious leadership. Um, so uh, Reto spoke about uh, the role of the Pope um, in the Catholic tradition, of course. Islam hasn't got that sort of counterpart. So it's a very difficult and very diverse and complex relationship that the Muslim world has within itself. And also, of course, how it relates to the outside world. Um, but interesting, and this is really a, a point that I will um, come back to in, in a couple of minutes, is, of course, that there are common reference points that the vast majority of Muslims um, will understand. That's the Quran, the revealed scripture of Islam, and also uh, the Sunnah, which is the life and the sayings and the practices of the Prophet Muhammad, which have been uh, extensively documented and uh, particularly his saying, sayings, the Hadith, are something that, that are very impactful, often quoted not just from, uh, you know, uh, the Friday sermon, but also something that has really permeated um, public life in the Muslim world. Now, just shedding some more um, light on the complex relationships that we have really in the Muslim world. And I wanted to sort of draw out a case study um, around the carbon economy, the hydrocarbon economy in the Gulf. Um, as you know, um, the Gulf uh, holds about 40% or so of uh, the known oil reserves, about a quarter of the known global gas reserves. So it's really a, um, a 
very critical um, uh, region, uh, both in terms of um, uh, perhaps the current uh, situation that we're in, in terms of climate change, but also, of course, what the future might hold. Um, what we also see, of course, at the same time is that um, a lot of the uh, economic growth, of course, that um, the hydrocarbon economy in the Gulf has fueled, also at the same time, of course, um, has made them um, uh, leading in uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, the Gulf countries are amongst the top 10 in the world in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a lot of research has been done in, in the LSE and in other academic institutions, of course, to kind of bring the link between those greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 emissions, particularly uh, in terms of combustion engines that, uh, of course, the, the oil uh, is fueling um, and that we all are using, most of us, um, uh, and of, of course, also then related to issues uh, for example, rising sea levels in Bangladesh. And that's uh, one area of work where my organization, Islamic Leaf, does a lot of work in. Of course, we have to sort of put the daily, uh, you know, sticking plaster on again um, when things are falling apart. And today we are looking at uh, excessive rainfalls causing flooding in Pakistan, in the Sudan, um, where we're not just struggling with desertification, but also, of course, now with floods. So uh, we have really climate chaos. and. This is something, of course, that the Muslim world is very much um, both perhaps in the center in terms of, uh, as I said, the, um, the hydrocarbon economy that drives the Gulf, but also on the receiving end in terms of some of the climate chaos, uh, looking at the, the picture in Bangladesh there in terms of sea level uh, rising or um, river uh, in bank erosions, which are very significant and causing of course, uh, significant impact um, on migration um, and well-being, etc. So these are the kind of problems that the Muslim world has to deal with. Um, now, what have we got, um, if you like, as a, a Muslim faith tradition to, to draw on in terms of the kind of moral capital, the religious capital, um, the social and the financial capital? Well, as I said, one of the common reference points that we do have uh, in Islam across this very diverse community is the Quran um, and also the hadith, the sayings, the life, the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, and uh, my colleagues, Loretta um, and of course Nick have already spoken about the Christian faith tradition. Um, and similarly, of course, uh, Islam being uh, part of the Abrahamic faiths, of course, we also have a concept that's very similar, of course, to the one uh, in Christianity, which is custodianship over environmental resources. And the Quran deals actually in a number of verses, and I just quoted one here, uh, with having um, put us as, as human beings in this position of stewardship or custodianship over those environmental resources. Um, and again, prophetic sayings are a plenty again that highlight the importance of um, looking after the environment because it doesn't really belong to us. Uh, it's really just entrusted by the creator to uh, humanity. And there also, of course, a very strong element in, in, in the Abrahamic faith is, of course, the, the element or the concept of accountability, the day of judgment. Um, so Hisab is also a, uh, an important concept, of course, in Islam. Again, numerous uh, Quranic verses uh, dealing with this. And we are also, as Muslims, um, uh, held to avoid uh, waste and overconsumption. Israf is also a concept that is very, very um, uh, prevalent in terms of preaching and teaching. Um, these are the kind of uh, particular the social um, capitals that we draw upon in, in our work. And again, as I said, the common reference points that are understood amongst the global Muslim community uh, are drawn here from the Quran and uh, the life of the Prophet. Now, taking it a little bit more to the financial world now, um, there are very strong uh, sets of, if you like, um, conceptual financial capitals um, that also are being drawn on. Um, so we have, I think, a very strong um, uh, value proposition in Islamic finance, for example, that is to do around the prohibition of um, interest, uh, riba, so usury is forbidden, um, that includes bank interest, includes other types of inequitable, unfair trades, they also are prohibited in Islam. Um, and there's also um, a very important um, Islamic social finance element, the zakat, which is the obligatory 
Wealth tax, if you like, 2.5% of one's disposable income per annum has to be given to charitable for causes. And it does, uh, and there are estimates, um, it does actually raise actually more than uh, what um, uh, OECD uh, uh, DAC members are raising per annum. So uh, it is a significant financial flaw that uh, can also be potentially harnessed for um, financial and climate finance. Uh, and also a, a very broad um, sweep there uh, around the, the Islamic law that drives, of course, um, the, the Muslim community's um, behavior to some extent. Um, so we do have um, prohibitions around socially harmful activities, alcohol, drugs, gambling, pornography, uh, again, very strongly um, uh, disencouraged, forbidden in uh, uh, our faith uh, traditions. Uh, and they're also in form actually now taking it slowly um, to climate finance. They also inform actually investment decisions um, by uh, Islamic um, banks uh, and investment uh, brokers, etc. So there are, is a particular set of Sharia screens um, that uh, are talking uh, particularly about um, uh, the ethical nature of the businesses that um, uh, Muslim money uh, so to speak, uh, should be invested in. Uh, and the Sharia, just a side note, um, you know, actually means just path. It means pathway to the waterhole uh, in, in traditional Arabic. So it's very much something for the, uh, the common good here. Um, now, finally, taking it um, to how we now applying or have applied those um, if you like uh, moral or religious capitals um, that scripture provides us. Um, the Muslim world has perhaps been lagging behind slightly in terms of um, awareness and activism in terms of climate change. Um, one of the very first and very interesting um, events here was the International Islamic Climate Change Declaration in 2015, building up to Paris, um, Muslim uh, religious leaders, community leaders, thinkers, academics were brought together also by uh, Islamic Relief by the organization that I work for under the auspices of the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Countries, uh, and the Islamic World Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. Um, and in this symposium, um, we, we, we've locked uh, community leaders, religious leaders, and academics into a room for a couple of days, really, to thrash out what Islam thinks and articulate those thoughts in a way that it is understandable to the layperson. Uh, in terms of the dangers of, around climate change and what the imperatives are from our faith perspective uh, on us to overcome this very, very critical situation that we're in. And uh, perhaps it's boiling down to quite a simple statement, but it's really making it uh, imperative upon everybody, um, governments and citizens alike in the Muslim world to fight climate change at the root cause. Now, hopefully, um, we um, have also perhaps influenced the Islamic banking sector in this. Um, the Islamic banking sector has been um, going uh, on for about uh, nearly 50 years, started in the 1970s. Um, and Islamic finance sort of includes, of course, the kind of banking operations that you know of uh, and are familiar with, uh, minus the interest. There are other kind of instruments that we can talk about perhaps later or at another point. Uh, it's quite a, a topic on its own, obviously. Uh, also insurance operations um, and um, securities compliant with Islamic law, with the Sharia uh, and those uh, Sharia screens that I mentioned. They are based on very old, on 1400 year old, year old principles and also something that uh, has uh, got a lot of traction in the Muslim world. Now, uh, one of the more recent um, uh, developments in Islamic finance was um, the development of sukuks, um, and you all are familiar with sukuks because the word uh, sukuk actually uh, is one of the roots for um, the English word check. So if you still have a checkbook, um, it's the Arabic word sukuk that actually uh, has formed this meaning, this word uh, in the in the French, in the in the English language, etc. Um, so uh, sukuks are a, a more recent development, and even more recent um, are green sukuks, 
And uh, as you can see, the first green school, actually a corporate school by a Malaysian energy firm uh, was issued in 2017. So only a couple of years after um, the uh, Islamic uh, climate change declaration. So we do hope that some of these investment bankers um, have taken heed and we did actually um, uh, influence them. And I can uh, ensure you a lot of lobbying has gone on behind the scenes um, in Paris with Muslim governments, with the OIC and also with the uh, Islamic banking and investment industry. Um, the Green Sukuk um, industry has um, since uh, accelerated and the first sovereign Sukuk was issued by Indonesia. Um, Green Sukuk here uh, raising about $1.25 billion uh, to fund um, primarily uh, solar energy, but also uh, transformation of the transport system shifting uh, to uh, rail uh, from roads. Um, and it's, um, of course, an area that requires a, a lot of money. And therefore, um, more recently, the Islamic Development Bank, um, which is the OIC, um, the, the Muslim um, Multilateral Development Bank, um, has also issued a green sukuk, its first green sukuk in, the, in late 2019, also raising around uh, a million euros here um, for, again, particularly solar energy projects um, and sustainable water and waste management in uh, their member countries. Um, well, I hope this trajectory, A, we can um, you know, track back to some of the moral and religious capital that we have in the Muslim global community. Uh, but also, I think you will agree with me, we can see here a positive trend towards more investment in some of the important economical transformations that are really necessary to shift us away from uh, the dependency on the hydrocarbon economy that is so critical, of course, in many parts uh, of the Muslim world, but also, of course, globally. Uh, and I hope um, that sort of given you, uh, it was a roller coaster, so forgive me for that, but I hope it's given you a, a short uh, insight in the complexities of what we're dealing with when we are trying to make changes in terms of uh, fighting, of course, uh, against climate chaos. And thank you very much. Wonderful. Mohammed, thank you very much. Thanks to all three panelists for their splendid introductory statements. Uh, this has given us a rich basis uh, with which to engage now. Before I open out the discussion to the audience, I have one or two questions I'd like to put to the panel. And please feel free to uh, pick up any of the questions that you would like to answer. My first question relates to a theme that Nick Robbins introduced right at the beginning of our session, when Nick talked about both the need to move the global economy to net zero and also to ensure that that transition to net zero is a just transition. And that raises a topic that I believe is very much at the heart of all religious debates on climate change, which is to ensure that we both meet our environmental obligations but also ensure that the poorest in society do not suffer too greatly. And there is a perception in some uh, aspects, with regard to some aspects of that debate, that a transition away from a high carbon economy will affect, for example, workers in sectors that will have to decline coal production, um, anything related to energy, and that's wedded to fossil fuels. So I wonder whether the panelists could tell us a bit more about what ideas, what principles different religions have put forward that would ensure that that transition is just and doesn't forget about the left behinds. Who would like to start us off on that? Nick, I, I see your hand and then Loretta. Okay. Um, yes, I mean, as I said, one of the things we've been working on is uh, is actually this question of the role of, of finance of banks and investors in, in, in the just transition. And I think for most investors now, particularly in light of, of COVID, a recognition that the uh, transition to a sort of net zero resilient economy needs to have a strong social dimension. So I think that that is increasingly um, recognized. Um, certainly in the work uh, we, we, we've been doing, uh, we've seen that actually, I think, sort of faith uh, investors probably at the head of the curve, as I mentioned, of the 150 signatories of the investor statement and just transition, 20% are, are, are faith-based investors from a number of different uh, faiths, in fact, um, from the Christian, but many others as well. Um, and I think what is really interesting about it is that it's provided a way for 
faith-based communities and investors who often actually focus on the social dimension as well as the environmental dimension to actually join the dots. So I think the, the Just Transition has, has provided a bit of sort of connective tissue, I would say, um, between the sort of the social motivations of, of, of faith-based investors and the environmental imperative. So I think that's why it's been taken up. I, I can't speak to particular uh, particular sort of statements or so on, but it's been very good here in the UK, um, having participation from Church of England representatives from CCLA and, and many others uh, in the work we've been doing, particularly thinking about sort of place-based investing. And I know in the US, again, through work of the um, Interfaith Council for Corporate Responsibility, again, which, which covers across, across the faiths, a lot of very, very steadfast work on the environmental agenda for many, many years, stewardship, shareholder engagement, voting, uh, and so on, but a, but a very strong element on, on just transition as, uh, as well. Um, so maybe, maybe, maybe stop there. Uh, Loretta, um, how do you, as a member of the Church of England, how do you go to communities that are dependent on income from fossil fuels? And how do you tell them we need to shut down your businesses and that that's what the planet demands? How do you make a religious argument that can square the two objectives here? I, th I think uh, I was, was slightly worried I might not have a Bible near enough, but I actually did have one here with me. Um, I'm looking uh, in the authorised King James um, and at uh, Genesis 1, 27 and 28. Uh, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female, he created them. And the very next verse, 28, and God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea uh, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. We are all made in the image of God and we are called to live in a, a, a loving uh, relationship with all God's creatures. And you cannot express that love by, if you like, making people work or leaving them to work in industries which destroy the earth, that is not godly. Um, so when we have seen uh, that we have, what we've done to the earth, to honour the, 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 to honour God's gift to us of creation, we have to find other ways forward. And um, what that tells me is that we have to look after workers uh, and we can expect companies we invest in to have high human rights standards for their workers and that we have to make sure that taxes are properly paid and collected because they provide safety nets to people who need safety nets when businesses close. And we have to incentivize our governments by encouraging them stroke lobbying them stroke pressurizing them to provide the kinds of policy uh, levers which help new businesses set up which are green which are sustainable so i think for all those reasons we must we and we can um, and i hope we will uh, continue to find ways forward for everybody to work in businesses that are good mm, thank you um mohammed um you mentioned in your presentation the the um, overlap between where uh, large populations of Islamic faith live and where, of course, uh, as in is the case in the Middle East, large quantities of fossil fuels have traditionally been uh, mined. Um, is it difficult making that argument about the move to net zero in those communities, in your experience? And how do you make that argument? Yeah, I mean, it is, of course, a, a massive challenge, as I, as I outlined, but... Um, I think we, we at the same time, I think we can give, you know, some of, um, you know, uh, the GCC, the Gulf Corporation countries uh, actually credit for, you know, visionary leadership here. Um, so, uh, of course, um, Dubai, for example, of course, was never dependent, actually doesn't have any uh, gas or uh, oil uh, uh, deposits. So it always had to carve out um, sort of in the backdrop of Saudi Arabia and, and Qatar, a different type of economy. Um, that has, you know, um, it's working. It's got other implications, obviously. Um, but also, of course, the Saudi um, government also now has its own vision 2030, which also looks at 
weaning off the Saudi economy um, of oil. Uh, and that's really is a massive, massive undertaking, obviously, um, because Saudi Arabia um, uh, and the whole Gulf region, obviously, over the last two decades have dramatically, uh, of course, um, uh, in terms of economic growth, of course, dramatically developed, um, have, have made mass, uh, major gains, of course, in terms of um, per capita incomes. Um, so there's populations now that have to also be weaned off and be taken onto this journey. Um, there is a mixture, obviously, between common sense, because we do know, yes, we do have perhaps, uh, you know, 40% of the oil deposits sitting in the region, but it's also running out. Um, that's also clear. Um, so it's now shifting this over. Um, there is also, of course, um, within the Islamic faith tradition, uh, I believe, a strong desire to fulfill our um, uh, requirement to be stewards uh, and custodians of this earth that God has given us. Um, and I, I do think uh, a lot of good work is coming out of Saudi Arabia. Qatar is also restructuring its economy to wean itself of gas. So I think a lot of good work is happening there. Um, uh, more needs to be done, obviously. Mm. Yeah, indeed. Good. Thank you. I, I'm going to park my own questions because uh, there are a lot of questions coming from the audience that I'd like to get into the conversation. And please, panelists, feel free to answer those questions that um, you would like to come back to. So not everyone has to necessarily answer every question. The first question comes from Amina, Amina Siraj, an LSE guest from Singapore. And Amina is asking, uh, we've just passed Earth Overshoot Day, so that means we've just... Uh, gone beyond the point where we would live a sustainable life on this planet. And she says, there's been a lot of talk about requiring radical change, not just creating net zero sometime in the future, but acting now and bringing about change much, much faster. And the question she raises, what do religious communities have to say to that? How much do they align with perhaps the more urgent, the more radical wing of the environmental movement that says the, the kind of reformist talk uh, uh, of changing our economies bit by bit isn't enough. We need much more radical action, much faster, therefore, to meet the challenge of the climate emergency. Where do religions stand on this? Who would like to go first? Loretta. Thank you. Thank you, Amina, for your question. Um, the way that resonates with me is in um, accountability. So um, if you... If you remember Jesus, uh, or to the extent that I've got Christians listening to me, you'll remember Jesus turning over the tables in the temple. Jesus very seldom um, is shown in the Bible as losing his temper, but he lost his temper that day with the exploitation of the poor. Uh, it was a, a, a rare incidence of righteous anger. It shows us that we should be, we should feel rage um, at, at the way some people are refusing to acknowledge how urgent a problem this is. But we don't discharge our full responsibilities just by being angry. We do have to find ways of getting change, not just in the things that are easy to change, but in the things that are harder to change too. So this is why in the divestment debate, for example, we have shied away from saying we'll just walk away from all these fossil fuel investments and just leave them to somebody else. Because our great concern is that that doesn't deliver change. That has the risk that those shares just fall into the hands of people who are quite happy to take dividends and don't care. Um, and we cannot change fast enough unless the world's major corporates responsible for fossil fuel emissions do radically change their business models. So we have to take the tough road but it does mean that we can't just wander along it. We have to hold ourselves to account and we have to be transparent about it. We have to keep pressing ourselves for innovations which make it more likely to achieve. I didn't mention in my opening remarks, but let me just mention another tool which with the help of the Grantham Institute, the church has developed, which I think is a really important tool to help what we're doing actually take root. And that's uh, the TPI transition index that's been developed. So this helps people who are passively invested, and that's a lot of us uh, as pension holders, our pension funds will be passively invested in equities uh, to uh, use a product which is designed to give credit to companies that are doing the right thing by the TPI tool. 
and uh, to tilt away from investments in companies that are not doing the right thing. So it's really incentivizing the change. It doesn't rely just on our word. It doesn't just rely on the threat of divestment. In the meantime, it provides a positive tool for people to channel money towards companies who are doing the right thing. And we've got to keep looking for those accelerators uh, because we do need to, we can't be complacent, but I don't want us to think of um, throwing our hands up and walking away as necessarily an answer. Indeed, indeed. And uh, you mentioned the TPI tools that are on the Grantham Research Institute website. Just for the audience sake, I should mention, we'll be posting a link to those uh, websites uh, at the end of this lecture. You can also pick those up in the chat function. Thank you, Loretta. Um, are there any other uh, contributions of that or would you like me to move on? Nick, please. You need to unmute yourself. I do, don't I? Yes, I need to unmute. <laughs> just, to, just to build on that, I mean, I think um, I think it's been remarkable to see um, how the investment community, banks and investors have moved around this goal of net zero, and, and particularly around 2050, a number of institutions, uh, such as Church of England, but others have, have committed to that. I think we need to recognise that that 2050 goal, obviously, is an overall average. And many things will need to be net zero before then. We're not all going to achieve net zero in 2050 on the 31st of December. Many things will need to be net zero this decade and, and, and next decade is not about waiting uh, until that 2050 moment. So I think the urgency is now. Uh, and I think we now have great examples such as that of, uh, of Denmark, where the, the national oil and gas company known as Dong has now been transformed into Orsted, an offshore wind company, generating much, much better returns than many um, oil, oil companies. So I think we can show how this transformation can, can happen. Great. Okay. I think I'll move on to the next question. Um, again, coming from Singapore. So welcome, Singapore. We have an <laughs> attentive audience there. Um, this one is from Ayako, who's a former student of the LSE. And the question is this, is there any all faith coalition on climate finance or climate policy? Uh, uh, Ayako says their focus would be diverse, so it would not be easy, but somehow principles are shared, uh, I thought. And indeed, most of you panelists have spoken about the Islamic or Christian groups that have organized. But what about an all encompassing global union, uh, an alliance of religious communities? Mm. Who would like to respond to that question from Ayako? Loretta. Uh Ayako, thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with the Faith and Climate Network here in the UK. I don't know um, whether the very same uh, network is part of a global network, but I do know, for example, from having been at climate related meetings in, in the margins of UN meetings when I was uh, Chief Exec of Christian Aid, uh, that there are always gatherings um, of uh, representatives who are multi-faith um, in, in the margins in preparation for, for some, of the, some of the big meetings. Um, so I'm not sure if there's one single sort of um, almighty network, if you like, um, but I, I am aware that we, we do work together globally very effectively, which is exactly why we were able to pre present a multi-faith 1.8 million signature petition to Francois Hollande in, um, in, um, in Paris in, in 2015. Thank you. Can I also just use that question to make oh. a related point, which is that actually I think some of the ways we can really help ourselves as people of faith is to recognise the influence we have over people who are not of faith, who nevertheless want to do, of course, want to do the right thing. And so although they might not share our faith at all or any of our faiths, they nevertheless recognise that we are morally thoughtful and they do look to us, which is exactly why it mattered to um, a, a non-Christian politician, what the Pope had to say back in 2015. Mm. And some of our important lobbying work as an investor, as an institutional investor, has been with non-faith actors. So for example, um, we are in the Climate Action 100 Plus Coalition, which is a coalition of investors with, I think, $40 trillion behind us as a coalition. And we um, have led on engagement with Exxon in that coalition, alongside the New York State 
common retirement fund. Um, and that is not a faith investor, but they look to us and we um, look to them as in investors who are morally serious and who, who recognize that the right thing to do is also the smart thing to do when it comes to investments. And, and I think that that's where we get a, a lot of leverage from our faith convictions is by effective partnering with people who are not of faith. Mm, yeah, indeed. That's a very good point to raise. Um, Mohammed, can I turn the question to you? Because you mentioned earlier in your remarks in the opening statement that the Islamic community perhaps was somewhat late in organizing itself to speak on climate change. Um, do you see uh, any cross-fertilization going on in terms of the ideas that circulate in different religious communities? To what extent do Islamic organizations and communities speak with Christian and other Isla uh, religious communities? And to what extent are ideas exchanged in this field? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly a, a lot of cross-fertilization. I mean, uh, you know, for example, we at Islamic Relief, we do work a lot, of course, with Christian Aid or CAFED. Um, it globally um, uh, around issues that have to do um, with the impact of climate change. So there is a lot of work being done, uh, if you like, in the humanitarian field uh, already. And um, obviously, uh, because we recognize that um, uh, people in uh, uh, low income countries in the developing world, if you like, um, that faith, of course, is a transformative uh, agent and uh, it can uh, and it is often um, an agent that you can use for good um, and of course climate change is something that um, very much appeals to people uh, from all faiths and none obviously as well um, so it, it provides a common language for for all faiths um, we have similar concepts of environmental stewardship uh, and the like. So there is a lot of work going on um, uh, in terms of cooperation uh, in the humanitarian field. Um, uh, some of the, um, uh, the um, there are different kind of climate networks uh, that also operate on, you know, as uh, the previous question uh, was, uh, that also op uh, cooperate on, um, on climate. Of course, the Muslim world, as I said, has been sort of slightly lagging behind, not because of a lack of awareness, because if you do live in Bangladesh and you have seen sea levels rise and your ancestral uh, homestead has been washed away numerous times, you, you do know that things are definitely changing uh, for the worse. So there is a lot of awareness, but it did take and needed to have some intellectual leadership, uh, like through the International Islamic um, Declaration mm. on Climate Change to actually bring that awareness into the Muslim world. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'm going to combine two questions that are on a similar theme. The first question is from Peter Selby, who asks about the impact of the pandemic on the future uh, climate agenda. And it's connected with another question um, let me scroll down from uh, Stephen Power, who also mentions the, the building back better theme and how many politicians have declared that after this pandemic, we need to move beyond a pure growth orientation in our economic model. We need to perhaps find new ways to define what it means to have a good life, to grow a more prosperous and what prosperity therefore means. And so the question from both our uh, uh, listeners is what does what do religious ideas contribute to a redefinition of the good life of a, a different measure of the quality of life and how can we find common ground in this post pandemic kind of recovery phase it's a big question admittedly um and you have very little time to define this agenda but um i'm sure the audience would love to hear your thoughts on that who would like to go first loretta please and then <laughs> Yes, please. Thank you. What great questions. Uh, thank you, Peter, for asking about the pandemic. Um, I mean, one of the things that struck me uh, when I was at Christian Aid, uh, wherever I traveled, I saw the impact of climate change. I also saw something else very close up, which was how poverty, uh, wherever it impacted, had a tougher impact on women and girls. And that's why at Christian Aid, we used to say anyway, that poverty had a woman's face. And there is a really important intersection of environmental wrongdoing uh, and other forms of wrongdoing of which 
humankind is guilty. And I think that one of the things that we're seeing during this pandemic is how, you know, what is a health issue does not impact the world evenly. It always hits the poorest hardest. It always exacerbates pre-existing inequalities. And if we go back to the first verse I read out from Genesis, we are all made in the image of God. We are all of uh, uh, inherent dignity and infinite worth. And that is uh, right there in, in the heart of Genesis. And if we go to Luke 4, we see that Jesus, uh, you know, reads the words from Isaiah that he came to, to be good news to the poor. Uh, he shows throughout his life a, a preference for people at the margins. And if we tackle any problem at all, we always have to tackle it with those inequities at the forefront of our minds. So... Um, I think what we're going to see as institutional investors, a much greater emphasis on the S in the ESG agenda. And those of us who recognise as we have today that we can't give up um, high priority for the E in the ESG agenda, we'll just need to find the sweet spots all the time about how we can address one and the other at the same time. And that's why we're trying to be comprehensive at the church commissioners in looking at in the round the full impact of our investments, how positive, how it could be more positive. And I, I think you'll see all serious institutional investors trying to get a grip of that and expecting our managers, our investment managers that we use, and we use dozens of investment managers, all to be raising their game too about the S in ESG and how it relates to the E in ESG, because we've got to build back better after this. It has had an impact, a positive impact, on the environmental agenda in the sense that we're not all flying around the world all the time and people are relying on uh, you know the ways like this to communicate with one another rather than traveling everywhere uh, but that can't be the sum of it uh, we've got to keep building on mm, thank you um nick um how does faith help in defining a new measure and a new vision for uh, the good life after the pandemic Oh, well, yes. I mean, I mean uh, just building on what Letter said, I mean, I think many people in finance, um, particularly fi and climate finance, are talking about scenarios and stress tests, sort of understanding how sort of the need to uh, improve our climate performance, making it zero resilience, is going to impact the portfolios. And of course, COVID is a live stress test. It is bringing forward um, the transition in many, many cases, peak oil probably coming forward from the sort of mid 2020s and oil now probably peaked already in 2019. So, uh, so I think that's one, one particular profound area. And as Loretta has been saying, clearly also these crises do have disproportionate impacts um, in, in terms of social impacts, particularly on gender, uh, people of color uh, and people particularly in developing countries. I think the, the, the shock of the crisis, particularly in developing countries, very, very profound. Um, and I think real concern about a number of developing countries fa facing new sort of debt crises and, 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 and so on. So, so clearly uh, we're looking to governments now, uh, particularly to, to stimulate their economies, make sure that that is aligned um, with, with net zero and resilience and investing in the sort of economies um, of, of, of the future. And so I think that a really interesting agenda, a twofold agenda perhaps, where can faith-based investors connect with governments on, on this, on the recovery uh, strategies, particularly thinking about particular assets which might be used. So sovereign bonds, um, EU probably going to be issuing about 200 billion of green bonds to, to finance that. Green sukuks again, uh, Mohammed was talking about, Indonesia is already doing that. I think interesting to see how we could have more issuance of sukuks, both for green and social to finance uh, the COVID uh, recovery. And then I think this question of sort of new measures, because we do clearly need uh, growth, uh, particularly in developing countries, but we also need to understand how financial institutions can generate returns for pensions, for payments, and, and all the things they need to do, but in ways that are actually are not linked to resources, resource intensive and environmentally destructive growth. And I think in many financial models still, sort of GDP growth is, is, is pl plugged in as a, as a constant. And I think that's probably one, one area that, that uh, faith-based investors could certainly, uh, could certainly take a lead, lead on to think about how existing investment models are, are, are predicated on continuous invest, uh, GDP growth and how some of those assumptions could be reflected on more profoundly. Mm, good.
Um, Mohammed, did you want to come in on this? Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the, the things that I think are worth mentioning here from, from an Islamic investment perspective, um, I mentioned the, the Sharia screen. So um, a, uh, a, a stock or share or a company is deemed to be Sharia compliant if it doesn't produce, you know, social ills, gambling, drugs, pornography, et cetera, et cetera. There is a big discussion now in, in the Islamic investment and impact investment space, obviously, uh, because these screens are negative screens. They're trying to work with the prohibitions of Islamic law um, to also uh, adapt to a, a more or a ESG focused um, screening, um, which would be um, really a dramatic shift. Uh, it would uh, uh, take on some uh, more of the positive uh, screens around the environment and the social impact. Um, and that would, of course, if you like, um, make potentially the green sukuks and other types of sukuks uh, go much, much further. But that's the sort of, you know, thinking that's already there to some extent in Islamic finance, uh, you know, looking at what, uh, you know, is actually a socially po uh, a positive good rather than something that's negative. So uh, we already have quite a strong um, ethical um, uh, value proposition there, but I think we now need to reach out and, and look uh, what, what the ESG kind of um, uh, industry can also bring into the Islamic finance space. Mm, indeed, thank you. Um, I've still got lots of questions coming in and I'm afraid I will not be able to get every question into the conversation, but I'm going to combine two questions again. They're both on the topic of unity of, of religious communities, unity in terms of uh, beliefs on, on climate change. The first question is for Mohammed Kursin. It's coming from uh, Kurad Zainab, who's an incoming LSE student from Dubai. So welcome to the LSE, first of all. Um, and, and Kurad is asking, um, you mentioned that the Muslim world does not have a central authority and is more decentralized than other faiths in a way. What challenges, the question uh, goes on, does this present for effectively organizing for a greener future? How can these challenges be overcome? So that was a specific question for Mohammed, but I think it raises a broader question about the unity of, of all churches on the matter of climate change. And I want to therefore pick up another question, which is from a current LSE student, Marie Williams, who asks about the uh, Christian churches in the United States, particularly evangelical Christians, who, as she says, are notorious for being alarmingly passive in the fight against climate change, uh, and who, as she notes, are also very strongly supporting uh, Donald Trump's candidacy for a second term. And Donald Trump has recently pointed out, uh, reminded us of his views on climate change, uh, having uh, announced that climate change is soon going to go away, perhaps very much like the pandemic. Uh, so the question is, how do we deal with those uh, divisions within religious communities? And, and, and is there a, are there mechanisms for creating consensus behind the battle against climate change? Mohamed, I'll start with you and then I'll, I'll hand uh, the floor to others. Yeah, I mean, it's, as I said, it's a, a big challenge, of course, in the Muslim world because we do not have um, the equivalent of a pope. Um, there are centers of learning um, that perhaps different, um, if you like, Islamic uh, schools of thought are um, focusing on. Um, but it is difficult, of course, to create a top-down sort of um, leadership on, on climate. Um, but at the same time, it also, of course, allows uh, for a lot more local action. Um, and there are, you know, a, a number of um, Muslim communities the world over that are actually um, acting, if you like, locally uh, without having necessarily perhaps the blessing from, from this global religious authority. Uh, but also, you know, um, maybe some, you know, uh, of course, religious authorities have also been perhaps quite conservative in the past. So it, it is a benefit perhaps also not to have it. So it, it's a double-edged sword. Um, we, we're trying to unite the differences um, because, you know, even amongst the different uh, faith communities, some of them are represented here today, but also, of course, the, the uh, you know, uh, amongst all of them, we probably have more in common that we have, uh, you know, uh, that we disagree on. Um, and especially the issue of climate, of climate change and environmental um, stewardship and custodianship is something that we can unite on, uh, whether we are Muslims, Christians, Hindus, Sikhs, Jews, etc., etc. Mm. Um, Loretta, 
How united is the Church of England? How united are the different Protestant churches on, on this matter? Well, the, the Church of England is, um, is, a, is a coalition of different traditions. It's, it's not one thing. Um, and there are different emphases placed on, on climate issues in different parts of the church. So um, it's, it's more traditional for liberal Catholic um, traditions within the Church of England to be campaigning for change and to be doing what some other parts of the church would say is work that's too political. I, I would say that Jesus was very political um, uh, with a small p and uh, he calls on us to, to do the same. And, and it's right to look at the states and to be concerned uh, that churches could do more and could be heard differently. Um, I know from the work that I've done on HIV, for example, that it was evangelical Christians in the United States changing their minds about the theological uh, diagnosis, if you like, um, around the problem of HIV that transformed the United States political response to HIV. And to go from saying, you know, HIV is a sin or a symptom of a sin to saying that HIV is a virus and the stigma is the sin was transformational for evangelical communities and they were very influential on the political front and uh, George Bush senior changed his approach entirely um, as that influence took hold uh, and became one of the uh, really the leaders in terms of funding to tackle the problem of HIV right across the world. And so you can see the potential if we could galvanize all parts of the Protestant churches to see these issues in the same sort of way. I know that there was work that I myself was um, involved in with uh, evangelical churches in the States to try and share some of our learning um, about how we saw the problem theologically and what could be done. And I, I indeed um, was uh, part of a meeting to the White House going back uh, to my Christian aid days now with uh, members of the evangelical environment network in the states to talk about these issues of justice so i think we've got to be quite careful not to to draw a kind of all-encompassing label um, over a whole tradition and say they're all the same i think we're right to recognize that there are differences of opinion and right to recognize that the more united we are the more powerful we can be so i hope that work is continuing mm. great thank you Okay, I think I can take one more question. I, I, if we have time, I'll try to get a second one in. There's a question from Amina, a recent graduate in PPE here in London. And she has a question for both Loretta and Mohammed. And the question is about educational roles. Faith-based organizations and institutions have a unique capacity, capacity to educate communities in the developed world on the issue of climate change by citing the moral and human dimension. This would also tackle perspectives that is a solely political, that it is a solely political issue, or that it does not impact them. Is this something which you have been looking to expand, or perhaps through fundraising campaigns, or in, in any other ways? Do you mm -hmm. think there is more to be done in that sphere? Loretta, do you want to go yeah, first? I'll, I'll dip in. I mean, the, the Church of England educates a million children in Church of England schools, and um uh, the, the the question of, of climate change is on the on the agenda um from a moral as well as a practical uh, viewpoint and i know that christian aid for example produced materials for use in church of england schools uh, to to help with that and um the the, the church of england does already uh, encourage uh, preaching and teaching around issues of environmental stewardship and, and of course, that's part and parcel of this work towards, as a church, becoming um, uh, carbon neutral by 2030 uh, is going to have to be underpinned constantly from, from now until then with, with teaching, explaining why it is so vital. Um, obviously, we haven't quite been in church in the, in the way uh, that we used to be in church. Uh, uh, and so what I'm hoping is uh, we'll take advantage of new 
uh, of new ways of being church that we have now uh, in the way that we're meeting now to to expand and accelerate this kind of teaching mm, indeed i think it's a problem we share uh, mm -hmm. the universities as much as the the churches uh, mohammed um what's the islamic perspective on on the educational role here yeah, I mean, um, it, very critical, obviously, um, and of what uh, Islamic Relief has been doing there, and not just in the UK, but also in, in the developing world, is to work very closely with uh, faith communities there um, and um, also to provide, um, for example, support with raising um, issues such as climate change, gender, GBV, FGM, HIV and AIDS, directly with faith communities, for example, um, in the Friday sermon. So we do provide support, um, ideas, information, even pre-written uh, texts that uh, the imams, the religious leaders uh, can uh, access easily uh, and work with um, if they want to raise these issues. So it's, it's, it cuts sort of, it's, it's, it's a sort of a, a process where we have to work top down. So first of all, we're trying to educate uh, the religious leaders and the educators because they're educating the community um, and give them the resources, um, the technology, the understanding um, to kind of broaden the horizon of, uh, of the faithful. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, and, um, you know, you can download also some information on our website, um, in, not just in the UK, but uh, the world over. Um, Nick, I want to give you the last word if you would like to come in on that. Um, you have your own e experience with talking to people, perhaps more in the financial world, to educate them about this. Uh, there was another question which I couldn't bring into this, which is how do you talk to those, particularly in the financial community, that are not of a religious uh, persuasion or who don't have that background? What works in, in, in talking about those challenges around climate change, in, particularly in the financial community? Well, thank you. I mean, I think one of the things we've been talking about and certainly learning from Loretta and Mohammed is about the sort of the right use of money, the right use of finance. And I think one of the things that's very interesting at the moment is that lots of guides out there about how people can change their lifestyles in terms of diet, in terms of energy and transport and so on. But very rarely does it focus on finance. So I think in the educational initiatives we've heard about, really thinking about how people can uh, put their own um, finance to work. Estimates suggest that actually moving to a sustainable portfolio is 20, 27 times better for the planet uh, than going vegan, vegan or stopping flying. So I think actually often we forget that. So I think we need a big exercise in uh, financial uh, literacy. My sense is that obviously faith um, institutions are, have huge leverage, both because they are asset owners, because then they actually, people are interested in man managing their assets. And I think uh, uh, that that sort of sort of ethical leadership using their moral capital can leach out into the rest of the, the financial um, si system. So I think there's a there's a actually a unspoken impact of faith investors, um, but perhaps that can become more uh, more powerful in, in in the year ahead. And that's why I think the sort of work that has been done on the institutional level with the work of people in faith communities is perhaps a sort of a particular focus over the next year. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I think initiatives certainly here in the UK, such as Make My Money Matter, has, a, I think, a, a, enough sort of um, I don't know, uh, showbiz pizzazz to sort of link that. And I think the faith communities could really add in. Obviously, many communities often have sort of campaign meetings uh, in different times, of the, in different parts of the week, some on different days. But that's a real opportunity, I think, to bring this, this, this question of, 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 uh, of finance and climates and, and faith uh, together when, when people come together uh, to, to, to pray and think about how they're going to change their actions. Wonderful. Thank you, Nick. Um, I'm afraid this is it. I have to draw the proceedings to a close. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I, I think I speak on behalf of the entire audience that this was a most fascinating event. Uh, we rarely have discussions bringing together perspectives of faith and finance, uh, and climate change is clearly an extraordinarily urgent and, and important topic for us to consider in this context. Uh, so thank you to the panelists for taking time uh, out of their busy schedules to speak to us and engage with all the wonderful questions from the audience. And to the audience, if you enjoyed the event and would like to attend further events either by the LSE Faith Centre or the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change, uh, please do come and visit our websites. 
you see them on the screen and there you will also find further reports on TPI, the initiative that was mentioned earlier on and, and other such climate policy initiatives that we're leading. But once again, thank you to the panelists and thank you for joining this event.